Welcome to Bigfoot Society. If you have Bigfoot activity to report from the same areas discussed in this episode, please reach out to me directly after this episode. And if you'd like to be on the podcast to discuss a personal Bigfoot encounter, please reach out to me directly at BigfootSociety at gmail.com. Do you wish there was more Bigfoot Society to listen to every week? Well, there is now. If you become a supporting member over at Patreon, you get a special members-only episode every single week on Wednesdays and sometimes even more episodes. Head on over to patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. And now let's get on with the show. This episode is an interview with Martin Groves about his Land Between the Lakes encounter. This was recorded at Monster Fest 2023 in Canton, Ohio. That's why it sounds way different than other episodes. But man, is it a fan favorite. So if you haven't heard this yet, you are going to love it. And then immediately go get Martin's books afterwards. Let's get into it. Also, the other thing is... I edit every episode for three hours. So you're going to see the behind the scenes Bigfoot Society is going to be a good time, but a lot of it might be edited out. We'll see. So all right, Bigfoot Society, we've got a good friend with me today. We've got Mr. Martin Gross from the LBL region, and we are live at Monster Fest. How are we doing, guys? All right. I'm pumped uh, that you're all here. You could be other places. You could be listening to Alex Petikoff. You could be uh, watching the Texas Dogman Triangle. And I give you the opportunity to leave at any time if you would like to, but I appreciate you here. Okay. Um, Let's see a quick look around the audience. Uh, No kids. So we are good. Uh, So, oh, Just a heads up, uh, we will be talking about the Land Between the Lakes, LBL, uh, Dogman stuff, Bigfoot stuff. I don't think it'll get too crazy, right, Martin? I'll keep it. (laughs) We'll keep it good? All right. But just aware, I like to keep my stuff good for kids. Um, You know how it is. But... uh, Let's start chatting. So Martin, uh, Martin Groves is from the LBL area. And I'm going to have him talk about himself for a little bit, but I point out that he's got a table with Hellbent Holler um, and he has written two books. First is Beast Between the Rivers and uh, Beast Between the Rivers, A Trace of Death. Uh, both great books. We'll be talking about some stuff from those today, uh, but you want to make sure if you like what you hear, uh, you can pick up a book from him at his table later. So, Martin, how are you doing? Man, I am super stoked to be here with you today, and it is it has been a long time coming. Oh, absolutely. Glad to see you. Absolutely. Do you mind giving our uh, our listeners that are live uh, a little background about uh, what you've done in the past that might be uh good for our conversation today. Okay. Um, I'm, it's really hard for me to speak of myself because I'm a very humble type person. Any, anyone that you meet will tell you that, that I'm just a old country boy and a humble guy, but um, I was privileged enough to take a job where I was trained in a career that uh, I received some really good training over the course of 32 years. Uh, I served as a frontline uh, uniformed police officer, and I've been a patrol officer. I've been a deputy sheriff. Uh, I've been an investigator and a detective in my past. Uh, The last five years of my career, uh, I spent um, on the street as a deputy sheriff. As I began to get older, I wanted to take a a step back and um, get a little more relaxed in my last few years, which didn't work out very well. But as you can tell throughout this country, it's it's a pretty tense time. Um, I've been trained, I guess, about to do anything in, in the police career, uh, from investigations to major and, and minor crimes. Um, I've worked homicide. I've worked uh, um, personal crimes, uh, bank robberies, you name it. But my entire focus of training uh, for me personally when I become a police officer was because I wanted to help people. That was my goal was to help people, not hurt people, but help and protect. And that's something I think we're missing today. But that's basically who I am. I spent my entire adult life as a uh, police officer since I was 18 years of age. 
Oh, that's great. And you, you can tell from, you know, the great thing about this interview is I can talk to you face to face. Yes. A lot of Bigfoot society interviews, almost all of them are across the screens, right? So it's very cool to be able to look into your eyes yes. and um, I can tell that you are hundred percent genuine. It's, it's very cool from our time talking earlier. Yes. Um, one of the quotes from your book that I found interesting was uh, I too have seen monsters and reading through your books, you've really had some, some interesting things happen to you and some interesting people talk to you about things. But I'm, I'm curious, uh, I always like to, f- to find out what was the, the one thing that first set you down the road to noticing that, wow, there's something weird going on in, in this area. What's this dog man thing? What's this Bigfoot thing? Um, in 1993, if you had spoken to me and asked me about Bigfoot or dog man or any type of cryptid or inhumanoid uh, creature that might roam uh, the world or America, I would have laughed. I, I'm being honest. I would have laughed. Uh, as a child, I recall uh, my father had taken me to see the uh, Patterson Gimlin film. And I was of the sound mind of there was one Bigfoot. And her name was Patty, and she lived in California. And there wasn't anything anywhere else, and that was it. And uh, But in 1993, I had an uh, experience that would totally change my life. Do you mind sharing about that experience? Yes. Okay. Um, 1993, I had been a police officer since 1980. And... Um, I had already been what I would call past the rookie stage and was what I would refer to as what we call each other as a seasoned veteran on the street. And um, so I had seen a lot of bad things in those periods of time, and we had made a decision. One of my coworkers and I, we worked midnight shifts together, and uh, an individual that I will tell you, his name is Harry and that is out of respect for him. He has now passed away, but Harry never wanted his story told, and he didn't want his family to be ridiculed in any manner. So I have honored that. Uh, unfortunately, most of the folks that I've worked with and, and uh, have known, it didn't take them too long to figure out who Harry was since he was one of my best friends. And, and uh, to tell the story, I would like to tell you a little bit about Harry. Not about myself. I uh, was not as strong of a man as Harry was. Harry was the kind of guy, when you meet him, and you can tell by looking at him, he was one heck of a strong man, and he had no fear, zero fear. He had a extremely uh, – his background was he was very religious. And so he felt like that as long as God was with him – He had no fear on the street. Mm. I've seen him do some pretty amazing things. There's a purpose of me telling you this, and you'll discover why. But Harry and I, we were, some people would call us a menace on the street at nighttime. Um, You have a riot, you call Harry or you call for, for Bubba. And we would go in, take care of business, and it would be put to a halt. And Harry was a certain kind of individual that he would be extremely nice, but if he told you to do something, he meant it. So I paired up with him. We decided to go into the land between the lakes and get some R&R and to spend some downtime. We had worked some pretty horrific crimes that, that year that I remember well. And so we wanted to do a primitive uh back what they call backcountry cabin camping in the land between the lakes. Now, I don't know how many folks have, that are here have been inside land between the lakes, but for our area, this is the Yellowstone for Tennessee and Kentucky. I mean, of course, it doesn't can't compare to Yellowstone, but for us in this region, that is Yellow, Yellowstone. Um, when you go into LBL, it's pitch black darkness. There's no artificial lights. You might get into the campgrounds, and there are a few campgrounds in the edge of the lakes, and you will see some electric light. 
But generally speaking, you're in an area of 170,000 acres. And if you put 7,000 more acres with that, where the islands are, that are uh, that surrounds the peninsula, it's the largest peninsula in the United States, uh, surrounded by two, two uh, rivers and man-made lakes. So there, there I've set you up for the story and, and where we can go right into it. Um, we went in on a Friday evening. Harry and I had prepared ourselves to be just as in, we were like Jeremiah Johnson or Daniel Boone. We had uh, that thought of mind, and we had kerosene lamps. Uh, we did have a couple small flashlights, but they were tiny. And uh, so we used a kerosene lamp, and we went in, picked us up a really cool camp campsite, got set up for the night. The first night we went into the area, it was a Friday night, and um, really didn't have anything occur. There is one notation that I might make, and I, something did occur that folks have told me later on. We're looking at this story as present, future, and all of it wrapped up together. During the night, I was awakened, and uh, it was pretty early in the morning, and I had a raccoon within our lean-to that had reached over and was touching my face. <laughs> and so it was kind of cool, and same token, it's like, you know, go on and get you something to eat. <laughs> but I've had some Native Americans tell me that uh, that was a very significant thing that I bring to your attention. So the raccoon touched me on the face and ended up exiting the area and left. Friday night went great. It was an awesome night. Uh, everything was just kosher until the next day. The following day was a Saturday, and we went our separate ways to do a turkey hunt. And um, he stayed with distal to the camp within a mile or two of the campground uh, of our camp. And um, I took off on a uh, stretch that is known as the Devil's Backbone. In 1993, I didn't know what the Devil's Backbone was or what the history was of LBL. And again, Pretty ignorant to the thought of Bigfoot, Sasquatch, uh, Harry Man, the Dog Man, especially. So when I exited my camp, I went turkey hunting, and that's what I did best. I did forget to tell you guys that I've been raised in the woods all my life since I was about four years old. And uh, so being in Land Between the Lakes was nothing uncommon for me. We had been in there since I was a child. We would uh, deer and turkey hunt and uh, definitely go crappie fishing in the lakes. As I go along, I'm doing what I do best and that is looking for a turkey sign and looking for animal sign. And for the most of the day, we have been back now and I've measured it, but I traveled about eight miles that day. And uh, as I went through the trails and the ridges of the devil's backbone, I um, I began to get deeper into the woods and I noticed that there was zero animal sound, sound or sign. And that should have been my first heads up for me. But being young and full of vinegar, I just took it in stride and just kept on rocking and going through my way. In the late afternoon, something happened that uh, is very important to this story. And that is when I got tired, it was almost uh, the late afternoon. It wasn't quite dark yet. I came out of the woods and just to take a break and sat down next to a log. And I heard a vehicle coming. And this was very odd, but I knew the, of an old logging road that was not traveled very much. And I had a uh, man of my uh, close to my age, and I was 32 at the time. And a uh, guy pulled up next to me and got out, and we began to talk and converse. And uh, before I knew it, we we realized that what we did for a living, uh, do I have any firefighters in here, any police officers? There is a rivalry between firefighters and policemen. 
every cop I've ever known has said, I always wanted to be a firefighter. And every firefighter always told me, hey, I wanted to be a cop. So we got to talking back and forth, and I discovered that the uh, gentleman was a firefighter out of the state of Kentucky and had done this for many years, and I explained to him what I did. And then we kind of kitted and cut it up quite a bit because his name was Bubba. <laughs> My name is Bubba. <laughs> so we went at it back and forth, and, you know, who's going to be the real Bubba and this, that, and the other. And uh, we talked for a while, and he started making fun of my, my weapon. I was carrying a shotgun. And he said, you know, it's not quite fair to be hunting turkey with a shotgun. And I kind of looked at the guy. I said, hey, man, what, what do you mean by this? Little did I know he was, I was talking with a very proficient bow hunter. And that's how he hunted his turkeys was, was an archery. And he was very good, and he showed me that. We spent 30 to 45 minutes talking, and we shook hands, and we parted our ways. And uh, he told me where he worked, and uh, he knew where I worked, I told him. And uh, little did I know when I parted and shook hands with this gentleman that I very possibly, and to my belief, after investigating it for many years, I was possibly the last man that saw him alive that day. And I wish now that not only because when we parted, he left me with a sentence. And um, I wish now that I had taken it a little more serious, but I didn't. And he had told me, he said, uh, you know, not trying to scare you or anything, but I've had something come into my camp. And then he explained to me where his camp was, and it was distal to my camp. I was only about two miles from him. Very important in this in this story. We shook hands, and he said, uh, you might keep your lantern or your fire going. I've had something that will approach my camp. It walks in, and it stays just outside the firelight. And he said it, it kind of scared him. And uh, so he gave me a warning to be careful at my camp. So parted ways, and uh, I began to go back to hunting. And I thought I might catch something on the way back. And uh, I began to walk back to my camp many miles. Now, it's close to darkness, guys, and it's getting real dark. But I was very confident. I had been uh, trained as a skilled as combat, uh, man tracking, and uh, urban and forest settings for tracking man as well as tracking beasts, any kind of uh, dog, cat, you name it, uh, deer, bear. And so I was confident in the woods, overconfident, I might say. As I began to trek back to my camp, things changed. Again, there was no insect noise. There was no animals anywhere to be found. The first thing that happened to me was I had heard a, a rock, what I thought was rock. Two rocks being struck together with great force. And I wrote it off because I thought, you know, I'm going back to camp. It is distal to my camp. It may be my hunting partner. And so I just kept on trucking along through the woods. And again, you know, no worries. Then something hit that was so significant. And little did I know at the time in 1993 how significant it would be and how it would be related to the missing 411 series by David Pilatus. Mm. I heard... I heard a noise in the woods that I've never heard again. I heard it twice that day. It was a metal screeching sound as if a huge metal door had opened and slammed. It was a noise that did not belong in the woods. And I knew the guy that I had spoken to, he had left. And I had traveled many miles from this log road now. So that kind of bothered me just for a moment but it still did not register. So I'm trucking back on a, on, on a game path. I'm high up on hills and ridges on the devil's backbone. And as I travel, I begin to see something in my peripheral vision as I'm walking. If, if I'm walking to camp, 
towards that back wall, I saw something to the right hand side of me. And for folks that doesn't has not been into the LBL, it is some of the densest dense foliage that you will ever see in the woods. You're lucky to see 15 to 30 yards with all the green and the trees and the briars and such. But I'm seeing something to the right of me, and it is seeming to parallel with me as I walk. Um, I've coyote hunted many times and been in many states, so I just believed that it was probably a pack of coyotes. In the Lamb Between the Lakes region, you can see as many as 30 coyotes in one pack. And they have been known to get pretty close to hunters, but they're really looking for something uh, to eat, maybe if you discard something. And it's you really don't get attacked. There have been some attacks. So I wrote that off too, guys. And there's a reason for me telling you that. I was just too lax, and I should have been paying closer attention. Mm -hmm. So as I began to walk these things began to get closer and I could tell that there was at least three, possibly four animals that were quad quadpedal on all fours. And um, as I walked along, the first real indicator that it was time to be scared or frightened is that as I walked, they would walk. If I stopped or slowed down, they would as well. That is not coyote behavior. They might freeze for a second and watch you. They won't stop right back up. This took place over a period of and 30 to 45 minutes. And so I made the decision up that I would stop and just freeze. I sped up, got a good pace, and then I froze. And when I froze, I'm looking to the right-hand side of me. These things stop. Whatever that they are, they just freeze with me. That's when I got scared. Now, when I walked, I always had my firearm unloaded. Somewhere at that point, it was a pump shotgun. I racked around in the chamber, had the safety on it. And um, I started proceeding walking. I knew that I was approximately a mile at the most from my camp at this point. That's when I began to hear a success, succession of what I would later find was like tree knocks. And I had knocks towards my camp and I heard noises in front of me. As I began to get close to the trailhead that comes out of the forest, I heard the metal sound for the second time. This time this metal sound was very close and it captured my attention forward. And as I looked at the edge of the woods, I was in a large stand of oaks, and I noticed that I had something coming out from beside the tree and then would disappear behind the tree again. Peek in, peek out, back and forth. And I got to looking and I'd realized that at my work, we had used uh, what we call ghillie suits. And that's what I thought I was looking at. I thought I was looking at a, a tremendous size of a man. And I thought it was a, possibly another hunter. And then it clicked on me that, oh, OK, I got it. Is this a coon hunter running his dogs? And these are just, I mean, I, I, I'm trying to make up excuses and thoughts in my head, like what this is. And it didn't click, you know, again, I just didn't have that mentality. As I'm looking forward in front of me, I can see this man and he's huge. He dissipates in front of my eyes. I think he's went behind the tree or he's went somewhere and I just can't see him. I'm still a little bit on guard, but I'm understanding that maybe I've got a hunter and I've stepped in someone's territory and they could be a little bit uh, shook up and worried about me being there. And um, I've kind of trespassed per se is what I'm trying to say. Um, I had to come out of the woods at that point and follow a path that went down a, a very steep hill and incline. And um, 
later on in life, I would discover where I was in, in this devil's backbone area. So I come down off the hills and uh, where we were located is the highest point in land between the lakes. So I had a pretty good climb going a downgrade. As I start getting closer to my camp, I still hear these things on my trail. This is all taking place. I'm still being followed all the way to my camp. I'm being pursued, but it's being it's kept at a distance. As I get closer to my camp, I can smell the fire. And I get closer, I can see my friend Harry. But he's got a really weird look on his face. Later I would find out I would find out why. And I began to explain to him, hey, I'm I'm sorry, guys. I'm, I've been out in the woods for a while, and I didn't mean to make you worry. And Harry said, man, it's not you. Uh, some things have happened in the camp. I discovered from Harry, and what I did not tell, because he didn't want the story told, but I've come out because his family has told me to, and I've got permission from them to speak. And uh, Harry tells me that he, too, had been followed into a huge corn patch. So now I'm discovering that my hunting partner has had almost the same type of altercation. He's had someone in the woods with him, but a key difference. And that he is now telling me that while in the turkey, turkey mode and hunting, he's in a cornfield. He's got a blind set up around him. And he's had a corn cob thrown past him with great power. That would have it would have taken a tremendous amount of force because the force that surrounds this hundred acre patch of corn, it's an old cornfield from the year before that's been left for the animals to treat on. And uh, this corn corn cob was thrown from the woods and goes sailing past his head. He's done the same thing as I have, except he believes that we've entered a field in an area where there's moonshiners. So, yep. <laughs> dummy here, I'm thinking, I gotta, I'm, I've got i trespassed where other people are hunting. My friend believes that we've possibly got in the area where somebody is brewing moonshine, which in the state of Tennessee and Kentucky is... Very typical. It happens everywhere. <laughs> and so we converse back and forth and we get settled down. And we decided that since we've been gone all day, it was time to eat. So we talk back and forth between each other. And I'm telling him what happened to me and he's telling what's happened to him. And then he throws a pretty strange thing in on the story that while he's in the corn patch, that he saw two orange orbs that come in from behind him, which is off the peaks of the devil's elbow. He described the orbs as as big as a beach ball. Orange, they floated across the cornfield and went into the woods. Now this time, I don't have a clue what to think. And honestly, right now, I don't have what clue to think either other than stories that I've received from other hunters and people who have researched these kinds of things. So we settle in and it's time to have some supper. We've got the campfire going and we're going to eat. What takes place is very hard to speak of. And I will speak of it as clearly as I possible can and try to keep any emotion out of it. Um, we're standing in front of our fire, and there is a 50 to 70 foot cliff above us. It's made of limestone. And things are beginning to come off this limestone, off this wall. First thing that happens, we have a small pebbles or little, little bitty branches. And, you know, things fall all the time in the woods, <clears throat> not paying attention. Then we have about a six to eight foot piece of wood that's been broken off and it comes off. It doesn't strike. It doesn't fall and hit anything comes sailing off the top of the cliff and hits a few feet from us. 
and it's it's a good sized piece of wood. It's nothing small. Starting to get into the freakout stage, and we're discussing, and we believe it's the possibility that we're being surrounded by hill people or moonshiners and it's time for us they're wanting us to go <laughs> now I told you guys the start of this story Harry's the kind of guy he ain't scared of much and he's not leaving his camp <laughs> and I've made the decision this is our camp we picked it out we're miles from anybody else there's miles that anyone else can go camping and hunting this is our spot and we are I guess we had the ideal of uh uh, this is our fort, and we're not going anywhere, and this is where we'll make our stand. And as we're standing there, you've got the noise above us. I see something to the, again, I'm looking at the wall back here now. That's the limestone. I see something to the right-hand side of me, and I see some glowing eyes. Back that up. I see something glowing. I want to ask real quick. You said you were prepared to make your stand. Yes. Internally, were you thinking this is it? I whatever is going to happen, I better be prepared. Yes. For anything. Yes. Okay. Very much so. We okay. we had made the decision that whatever took place, uh, we'll make our stand right here. Okay. We were not going to run. We weren't going to relinquish the camp to, to somebody. Gotcha. And uh, it's a very good point. Very good point. And. Uh, so if you've ever been out in the woods or anywhere else and you see a cigarette glow, someone's drawn on the cigarette and it gets real bright, cigarette, cigar or something. That's what I was saying. So now I'm further convinced that we've got some old yahoos <laughs> and these hillbillies not going to run us out because we was hillbillies too. <laughs> and so to be honest with you, that's our, that's our thought, you know, Hey, we ain't going nowhere, man. And, uh, I'll be I'll be honest with you. We was armed pretty heavy. We were armed, and uh, so this thing that's standing beside the tree, I really believe it's a man back there smoking a cigarette, cigar. Harry sees it too, and uh, he said, "I'm I'm gonna get this guy, man." And uh, so we stood by there, and he started to back away from the fire a little bit. I knew what my partner was going to do because I'd seen him do it a hundred times. You go snatch somebody up. And I'm standing there all of a sudden to distract us, um, a 25 to 35 pound rock comes flying above us. We hear it sailing. It didn't fall. And the reason why I give you these descriptions so you'll understand, it doesn't go clunk, clunk, clunk down the wall. It comes flying, and we can hear it. It lands right between us, closer to my partner than to me. And then when it hits, it thuds. By this time, I've had enough, and I lose my composure, and I go into my policeman mode, and I begin screaming. Who's out there? Maybe some colorful metaphors or something. <laughs> but something came out, and I said, hey, you know, we're, we're police officers. We're armed. You don't come into people's camp at this time of night. Come out from behind the tree. Harry begins to walk away from me, and that's when the, the encounter comes into play, and it gets real deep, and it gets heavy. Okay. Folks, what you're about to hear is so far-fetched that it's hard for anybody to believe, except from where I've heard other witnesses 20 years later, I hear people say this. I began to hear a very guttural um, growl that I cannot describe. A farm boy, I've been on the farm where if you kill a pig, they have some pretty intense sounds. I look back now and I think about it that it was almost like a demon and I could hear it. And it began to get extremely intense. Harry has froze. He's he's a few feet from me, but he is frozen. He turns around and looks to me, and he gets a little closer and takes two or three steps, and we go into a combat stance like we've been trained at work. We're almost shoulder to shoulder at this point. Then it changes. The growl gets lower, and as it gets lower, we can still hear it, but now we feel it. It begins to vibrate, 
and it vibrates and permeates my chest. The same thing is happening to me. I can see it's affecting Harry as well. And it begins to permeate in my chest, and I begin to get tunnel vision. It's an it's almost like an energy level that there's no way to explain it. My breathing became erratic. I began to feel like I was going to pass out. My ears were affected. My ears were burning. All these different symptoms are coming in on me as well as my partner. It got to the point that it was so intense that I felt like I was going to expel and to throw up. This goes on, and I, as long as it takes me to tell you this, this feeling, it's milliseconds. This, this happens just like this. And we freeze, and there's no moving from, from, from this position. And uh, I'm very shaky, unsteady on my feet. Those are all the symptoms of what I'm feeling. Then to the, uh, what I would call to the west of my camp, we hear noise. Now we're frozen. We cannot move. We got something above us. We got something over here by the trees on the other side of the camp. Now we have something coming in on the very same game trail that I actually was had come in from. Looking back now, I know whatever followed me through the woods had just stopped at the camp and was waiting. This beast, this creature that is not supposed to exist comes walking in on us from this trail. Folks, I'm looking at something that stands six to seven foot tall. It is upright. It appears to be wolf-like. It has the pointed ears. And please stop by my booth and shake hands and say hello. But look at that picture. There is a drawing on my table where not only myself, but another lady from LBL, this is the drawing that we've all seen. This thing had pointed ears, it had a snout, and it was almost as if it was, it was almost as if it was grinning at me. And it was like it was, it, it, it could, it, my feelings was it was feeding off my fear. And it would come close and kind of back away and get closer. I've got the growling going on. This thing is making noise. And the fear level, it is almost as if it fed off of me. And as it began to get closer, the only thing that I knew to do, and this part's hard, but the only thing I knew to do was to pray. And I began to pray David's prayer, Psalm 23rd, and I began to pray hard. And I knew at that point that I was going, I felt like this is it, God, I'm going to die. I really had that mentality, this is it, whatever this thing was. I'm looking at it, and as I began to pray, and I got to different parts in the prayer, I shall I shall fear no evil. Thou art with me. And uh, I began to get strength. And as I got stronger, I felt that I could move. As I moved, my training kicked in and my right arm moved. And I remember it so distinctly. I'm praying my mind, but now I'm starting to pray aloud. I withdrew my service weapon that I had underneath my, my vest, and I came out with my service weapon. Now, folks, I tell this in a manner that I don't really come out with everything, and I can't, but I fired two rounds in the direction of whatever this thing was. Please keep in mind that that is something that was very hard for me to do. Every round that comes out the end of your gun, you've got to know where that round goes. I didn't know if I was looking at a man in a suit. I didn't know if I was looking at uh, an animal. I didn't know what I was looking at. But one thing that made my mind up 
when I fired was that when I pulled my firearm up before I discharged, it was looking at me and it backed off and it backed away from me in the opposite direction of me. But when I lowered my gun, it came forward. So when I lowered my gun and it came forward, I fired systematically or sympathetic fire. My partner behind me had a 10 gauge double barrel shotgun. He fires in the direction of whatever was in the woods beside of us next to this tree. And I hear screaming, a scream that was so hideous that I compare to when you, um, when you take out a pig that you're going to butcher. And then this thing begins to have a fit over here beside of me. Now, the, where I have fired, this thing dissipates in front of my eyes. It's gone. But in that period, just a millisecond, whatever took place when I fired, something goes up that wall. I can't see it, but it's gone. And we're hearing noises above our, our, our uh, camp. This thing over here where Harry has fired his weapon twice, two barrels, it's screaming and it's having a fit. And there's a cane patch beside there and it's just tearing everything down. But it doesn't come in. Neither does this up above me. Nothing comes in. We make the decision it's time to get out of Dodge. And uh, so we exit the camp. We jump into the truck. And he can't get it rolling. I mean, it's something like out of a horror flick that the truck won't roll. And he had accidentally put the emergency brake on uh, when he parked, and he just forgot about it. So he, he pops the emergency brake. But this story is only just beginning. I, you know, you would think that the story is going to end right here, and we would be in safety, and everything would be cool. Headlights pop on. And this is a question you've asked. What I see up here in my camp is six foot, less than seven foot, dog-like, and is very stereotypical of the dog man of the LBL. When the headlights come on, I've got two creatures in front of me that is totally the opposite of what I had seen in my camp. Mm. I have two hairy men. I have two eight foot or greater Bigfoot. Really? And these things are hideous. This is not Harry and the Henderson. Yeah. This is not your TV show where you see one grin at you and it's just like, hello, Bigfoot. <laughs> <laughs> these things right. were hideous. Uh, the larger one that I perceived to be a male, uh, an adult male stood its ground and was piercing, just staring right at me. The second one had fell down into a spider crawl where I don't know if it was on its hands or if it's elbows, but it was down low and crouched as if it was ready to jump up and strike. So partner gets the old Dodge fired up and we get to rolling. And as we roll out of this campsite, keep in mind we're miles and miles away from anything or anybody. We have to cross and uh, Hell Ben Holler yep. has actually been out to the location to investigate the site. Uh, we were down a ravine and, and uh, uh, across uh, Russian Creek in LBL. And so we have to go down deep into the creek and then jump back out of the creek. Even for a four-wheel drive, it was hard. He hit that creek, and I heard something thump the truck. So we're coming out of the creek. These things in the cane patch, there's three, possibly four of them. They're ro rolling through but something tries to get into the back bed with me and he hits it and he's screaming at me from the cab. I'm actually, I'm sorry. I didn't tell you, but I was in the bed of the truck. I just jumped up into the bed of the truck and I'm hanging on for dear life. Wow. And, uh, so he hits one of them and I later find out when he's screaming at me, he says, I got one. I got one. We speed up out of here and we get out of Dodge. Our first instinct or mine was, uh, was the opposite of my hunting partner. He wants to exit LBL and not tell a soul. We're police officers. There's no way that we're going to tell anybody anything. Because these things don't exist. 
they're not supposed to be alive. They just don't exist was the mentality and mine. And uh, so about a mile or two up the road, I'm beating on the cab of the truck. Let me in. Stop. Let me in. And he was well known for being a pretty fast driver at work. I finally get him to stop and he lets me to get in the car and truck with him. And we head towards the exit of the southern exit of LBL. He wants to leave. And I'm, I'm to the point we're almost verbally fighting with each other. Um, we've got to go to the check station. We've got to go find some authorities. I've discharged my firearm. I have an obligation to report this. And uh, Harry is to the point we're not telling nobody anything. I'm going home. You do what you want to. And he's flying. And finally, I, I had to, I really had to be forcefully with him and tell him, stop at the check station. After coaxing him into it, it's, it's, you know, it's late. It's almost midnight. He pulls into the LBL South check station. It's closed. There's nobody there. 1993, they were driving a uh, two-door cheap Jeep Cherokees. And so there's two or three of them in the parking lot, but the lights are out. I convince him that we're going to the North Station, which is 43 miles away from the opposite end. It's about 43 miles one way. He doesn't want to do that. And so we compromise and we stay on the TVA guidelines, which is totally mowed down and there's nothing growing. So we can see for great distance. So if anything comes close to us and uh, he gets inside the truck, rolls windows up, locks the doors. I agree to stay on top of the cab of the, of the Dodge truck. And I set up and I watch the fields around us. And uh, folks, we, we have a child in here, so we won't, won't say it, but we were pretty dirty and nasty by this point. Uh, if you've studied anything like, like this, most folks that are hit with a, a level of energy or what some folks refer to as uh, possibly infrasound or a type of infrasound, you will you lose your body functions. And I had at some point thrown up on myself and we had gotten soiled, both of us. So we stayed. Next morning we get up, we get cleaned up, we change our clothing, and we're going to the south check station. As we begin to prepare, we can see maybe a mile down the road, we see three or four marked units coming. They were park rangers. But by the time we got out to the road, they had done whiz by us, and they're going in the direction of where we were camping, which is Russian Creek Road. And um, if we have time, I need to tell a little about something that's taken place there. So they go in, go ahead. What's our time level? We're getting there. Okay. Uh, I, I can already tell that I'm going to have, I'm going to ask you probably yes. to come back on for a future episode. No problem. No problem. The, you want me to end it up now? This needs a little bit. The okay. story is incredible and yes. everyone needs to get the book. And I wish we could talk for five hours. Dang it. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to end the story up where those patrol vehicles were going to, they were going to the count of my buddy that I met that we call Bubba, the Kentucky fireman. And two turkey hunters had actually walked in and were going past his camp going to, to hunt that morning. And they discovered his body. And he had been pulled out of his tent during the night. Whatever attacked him had broken his bow in half. If you've got any bow hunters, that's almost a, a feat that is unreal. It broke the bow, but it, it eat the man. And he was predated on. And um, so that's where they were headed to. Um, long story short, we go, we do go to the South Check Station where we are accosted and we are treated lesser than a citizen. We are told that we're going to be arrested for poaching bears and said that they had had reports of a bear that had mange 
and that it had been bothering the campers for the last couple of weeks and that we were just scared city folks. And we didn't know the difference between a bear and what we had described to him. They held us for quite a period of time and contacted our sheriff's department, took our firearms away from us, and we were held there for a couple hours until we were finally told, leave, don't ever come back up here. And if you talk about that, and we'll talk about it at a different time, but we were told to keep our mouth shut. To end this, what brought me out of the woods? Why did I come out of the closet? In 2020, you will not find anything on any paper or on the newsreel. But in 2020, a husband and wife entered the devil's backbone. And when they went in, they parked their car at the edge of the South Check Station, and they've never been found. When I discovered this, I couldn't couldn't live with it any longer. Mm. And that has set me from... From 1993, I have secretly investigated the OBL until this point right now. And the things that we have found and the things that we have discovered, there's between 25, depending on who you speak to, there are between 25 and 28 people that is attributed to unknown animal attacks in the OBL. So there you have my story, and I hope I was able to convey it to you in a manner that you can understand it's not an easy story for me to speak of as you can tell and uh it's something that 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 haunts me to this day my wife is here if you'd ever want to stop by and speak to my wife my wife will tell you of how that it has affected a seasoned police officer Mm. that wasn't afraid of anything that i have nightmares uh constantly i'm still battling them i'm still fighting them Martin, your story is incredible, and I'm, I'm so glad that you were able to come forward and, and share that in different mm-hmm. ways. And we had talked earlier, and you said we just have a few minutes left, but you said we need to make sure that we talk about the correlation or the connection between Bigfoot and Dogman in yes. the LBL. And I don't know if we can fit that in. Okay. But um, since, since 1993, I've, I've investigated heavily. There's been a uh, longstanding rule between researchers and people uh, that speak of the LBL that consider themselves to be a, an authority or, or per se expert researchers. And they say that Bigfoot resides on one end of the LBL and the dogmen only are seen on the opposite side. But in reality, the, the correlation between the two, not only are they in the same areas, but we have discovered where some of the Bigfoot are always accompanied by a pack of these creatures or beings, whatever that they may be. And it's, it's extremely fascinating within the last year of the tracks that we have found and of all the witnesses who have come forward. And let me assure you guys of one thing. Every park ranger in that place, they'll tell you nothing resides there. Mm. However, every single one of them gets the reports, yep. and they know what is in these parks. And in, interesting enough, Cryptid Studies Institute, a very super folk family that have been investigated, they're very religious, the most impeccable witnesses you would ever meet. They they would never tell any fabrication. Their brother and sister and their father started this investigation team. They were in May the 17th, and I was there, but I was not with them. A group of researchers were in, if some of you have ever heard of Barton Nunley or uh, like Hell Ben Holler, people like that. They were not there this time. Uh, the Hendersons observed on May 17th between 10 and midnight and they had a chief of police with them that has retired out of the state of Western Kentucky area that I will respect his name because he doesn't want his name mentioned. They saw the dog man. It crossed in front of their truck. And now we live in the age where I see most of you have your cell phones put up. Everybody's got a cell phone. It's in their hands or people scrolling through, looking up what they're going to eat, whatever. 
these three researchers were such in awe and so struck by what they saw that they couldn't even get to their cell phones. This, this encounter lasted less than 20 seconds. The dog man run across from them. I urge you to go to Cryptid Studies Institute and listen to the description of what they put out and what this thing looked like, because I didn't really give you an accurate, really detailed description of this thing. But there's your correlation. These things run together. Now, a young lady, it make this quick. A young lady just tipped me up. She had seen us in the movie American American Werewolves. Yep. And uh, and Seth did an incredible job with that and allowed us to, to get some information out. The lady came up to me, and she traveled all the way from Virginia to actually see me and ask me one question. And the question was, what was the correlation? What was the role of Bigfoot with the dog man that night? And she wanted to know, was it there to protect us or was it there to direct the dog man who acted like a pursuing, like a hunter and their bird dogs? I have no answer, but I can give you my opinion. And I believe that these two Bigfoot and the lady said it best last night Mm -hmm. on the panel. They have different personalities. Yep. These two were not the kind and and nice Bigfoot, you might say. That's the only way I know to put it. And I do believe that they directed them, and that was their hunting dogs. And last thing, very quickly, Demumbers Bay. Oh, Eleven people have been massacred in Demumbers Bay. Yeah. This October, October of last year, we found where two Bigfoot – were with a pack of at least three. They killed a deer in the middle of the campground, broke its neck, pulled the head, spine off, took the rest of it with them. But the tracks indicated to us and showed us Bigfoot was there, Dogman was there present, and it was as as if the Dogman chased the deer directly towards the Bigfoot. So is it possible that's what was taking place that night? We were supposed to get eat up. So anyway, it's very interesting to be here with you guys. I hope I was able to give you uh, some thought. Uh, the Demumbers Bay story you talk about in your books, I mean, that alone could be another hour, I feel. I mean, yes. definitely check out martin's books it's incredible there's pictures of the tracks that you found Mm -hmm. Uh, but thank you so much for coming on the show today live at monster fest a few things uh of course again i'm going to say it one more time please check out martin's books they're some of my favorite that i've read in the last few years and they're super easy to read Uh, if you like bigfoot society if you like hearing uh, people talk about their encounters. Um, I have uh, business cards and free stickers over there. I'll hook you up. Make sure you come up afterwards. Uh, I'll be over by the STM booth. But um, thank you so much for taking your time to choose yes. to listen to this today. And Thanks for, um, for people that listen to Bigfoot Society, I appreciate you. Uh, more than you know, uh, the goal is to do this full time one day. I am 20% of the way there. I will be full time and hopefully get to go to places and interview people face to face like this. So uh, I appreciate it more than you know. And um, for those that are longtime listeners, if you're into the Van Meter Visitor, Okay. Um, some people will get that. There are shirts that should be only at the festival actually here at monster fest at uh, map and blacks booth. So make sure you don't miss out on those, but thank you so much for coming. Thanks thank everybody. Mark. God bless you all. Glad to be here. Glad to be here. Special thanks to Seth Breedlove and small town monsters for inviting me to monster fest as a guest this year. Uh, Without that, this episode would not have been possible. If you'd like to make a special one-time donation to Bigfoot Society, you can head on over to our Buy Me a Coffee page. And I'd like to shout out uh, someone who has bought us a coffee this last week, Mr. Waylon W. Colburn. Uh, His message is, I love the show. I used to listen to... Insert the name of another popular Bigfoot encounter podcast. But they never have any new stuff. Keep up the good work, my friend. Well, I appreciate that, Wayland. 
If you'd like to buy me a coffee as well, you can head on over to the show notes and find the link in there. Please take a minute to help out the show by subscribing on YouTube, making sure you hit the bell so you don't miss any notifications, and share the episode on YouTube with a friend. Also, if you're listening to us on a podcast, thank you so much. Make sure that you're subscribed, share the show with a friend. Really, it's all about sharing the show wherever you can. If you've had a Bigfoot encounter related to the following or know someone who has, please reach out to me at bigfootsociety at gmail.com or pass on my email. Here's the list. All right, I'm going to use this space uh, this week to announce that I'll be at the Sasquatch Summerfest in Oak Ridge, Oregon as an attender. I won't be presenting or anything, but I'll be hanging out trying to interview people that have had Bigfoot encounters. If you're from the Oak Ridge, Oregon area or surrounding and you've had a Bigfoot experience, please contact me directly, bigfootsociety at gmail.com. Also, Priscilla was nice enough that if you get your tickets through SasquatchSummerfest.com and use code BigfootSociety, you can get 50% off the cost of your tickets, which is a big amount. So uh, code BigfootSociety to get 50% off your tickets, SasquatchSummerfest.com, and uh, helps out the podcast as well. A special thank you to all the Bigfoot Society Patreon and YouTube channel members. It's your support that helps keep the show going, and I extremely appreciate it. You want to join in the fun? You can join over at patreon.com forward slash the Bigfoot Society. I'll see you there. And again, thanks for listening. I can get on here and we can tell our stories. Maybe there's somebody else out there listening that's too afraid to tell their story. Maybe this will give them the courage to come out and not feel so bad about it. Who cares what anybody thinks? I know what I saw. I know what's out there. That's all I care about. let people know. Please let them know. If you ever see one of these things, you need to tell. Because if you don't, then shame on you. You know? Shame on you.